And Father, as we come and open this passage from Colossians, uh, we thank you that you are so concise and precise. Father, help us to understand, uh, help us to grow to be more like Jesus and help us to love you more and to love one another more. Amen. Well, a group of friends went deer hunting and paired off in twos for the day. And that night, one of the hunters returned alone, staggering under the weight of an eight-point buck. Imagine it. Oh, where's Harry, he was asked. Well, Harry had a stroke of some kind. He's a couple of miles back up the trail. You left Harry lying there and carried the deer back? Well, said the hunter, I figured no one was going to steal Harry. <laughs> Today is about priorities, putting first things first. The preaching professor Haddon Robertson points out that one old recipe for rabbit stew starts this way, first catch the rabbit. Says Robertson, the writer knew how to put first things first and that's what we do when we establish priorities. We put the things that should be first in place in their proper order. So in Colossians 3, Paul paints a glorious picture of the Christian life and he wants us to put first things first. He crystallises uh, a life lived in the glory of Christ, for it is a life unlike any other. It's the radical Christian life that we have been raised with Christ and so we should be putting first things first. So you who have believed in Christ, so you who have been raised with Christ, how do you put Christ first? How do you do that? How do you live in a way that brings him glory? Uh, earlier in the letter in Colossians, uh, Paul un unraveled the death of Christ. He said that our certificate of debt was nailed to the cross and then the forgiveness of sin and the defeat of powers and authorities, the triumph over spiritual opposition. He says that God made us alive in Christ. We are no longer dead but alive and now in chapter 3, the Apostle considers this life commitment of living in the company of our resurrected Lord. So how does one live as a person made alive in Christ? Well, physically, we're not yet with him, yet every ounce of our being belongs to him. In verses 1 to 4 in chapter 3, Paul reminds us of our status in Christ. So he says, seek things above and set your mind on things above. There is no room here for laziness. Don't slouch on the couch as you prepare yourself for glory. Reject the old life that held you captive, Paul says in verses 5 to 11. Put on the new life that Christ has won for you in verses 12 to 14. Become the person that Christ enables you to be, become the church that receives Christ Jesus as Lord and continues to live in him. According to chapter 3, verse 1, you have the privilege of being raised with Christ who sits at God's right hand. Already you have, um, have ascended with Christ, which may seem to be an oddity because here you are sitting in a chair right now. But spiritually we are positioned with Christ, although this is not our immediate experience. But here is the promise, which is so certain and so true, that we can speak of it as being a reality even now. And whatever happens on earth, nothing can rob you of the promises that Christ has given you. You have been raised with Christ and God will never change his mind. Oh, that was just a mistake. I didn't mean to raise Mark with Christ. I'll undo it all, start again. But, you know, it was a big mess. Now you have the promises and God will will never let go of those promises. This is your position. 
This is your reality. This is the victory of the cross and the triumph of the resurrection, that you died with Christ and God raised you to live with him. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Is this what you believe? Does this grab you? Then listen to Paul and seek things above if it grabs you. Oh, the NIV read as the Greek, set your hearts on things above. But the word heart, interestingly, isn't in the text because Paul's a little more expansive in his thinking here. Whether it be with your heart or with your mind or with your emotions or with your body, whatever it is, seek things above. Direct your life toward heavenly things. Uh, Dick Lucas was a minister at uh, St Helens in London for quite a few years and he wrote an excellent commentary on Colossians and, uh, and we'll see a quote there from him. He says that Christian is one constantly looking upwards and drawing close to the throne of grace. To seek things above then takes us to the very summit of Christian experience in this life. It is daily to hold fast to Christ as the centre and source of all our joys. It is to enter his gates with praise and come into his courts with thanksgiving. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek life in the kingdom of the Son. Oh, the thought continues in the verse 2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Pay careful attention to your minds. Don't program your minds with the depravity of this world. Be discerning. Use your renewing mind to come to a true understanding of the heavenly Christ who died for you and is now risen and is seated beside the Father. Friends, there can be no compromise it simply won't work, half of you in heaven and half of you on earth. What a stupidity. Now, what were you thinking? It's a contradiction, but we are people of contradictions, so we must take care. Maybe you remember Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Paul captures this thought in verse 3, for you died for you died you were crucified with christ and you died your old obsessive self with its cravings and desires and its indulgences your old self died your old self who delighted in itself righteous passions and cared nothing for the rule of God and for the love of God, your old self died. You are not now the same person you once were. Your life is hidden with Christ in God and he will come again and then according to verse 4, you also will appear with him in glory. Friends, it's, it's game, set and match. That's it. You died and you have been raised with Christ. Your life belongs to Christ and you will appear with him in glory. There's no going backwards. God has saved you through Christ and marked you as his very own. So with all your energy, seek things above. Seek the rule of Christ and the love of Christ and the transformation of his spirit working in your hearts. Live as dead people given you Life, game, set and match. Oh, but don't put your rackets down yet. Wouldn't want you to do that. Don't retire injured. Don't do a John McEnroe and spit the dubby and walk away from church and what Christ has won for you. The game is not over. Therefore, put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. As we see in verse 5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways. 
in the life you once lived. But now you should rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice and filthy language from your lips. I do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being re renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Do not say, I believe in verses 1 to 4 and then jettison verses 5 to 14. Do not be even tempted to think in such a way, as Greta Thunberg said in a speech at the UN Climate Action Summit. How dare you? How dare you say that you are raised with Christ and that not live like you are raised with Christ? So how do we live as people raised with Christ? How do we set our minds on things above? Well, we do something. That's what we do. We do something no other person would do. We do something because the Spirit of Christ is driving us in a fresh direction. Friends, Christianity is not a passive religion. So don't sit around doing nothing. That's worldly. That's lazy. That's apathy. That's quenching the Spirit. Put to death your earthly nature, put to death sexual immorality, put to death impurity, put to death lustful thoughts, put to death evil, evil desires and greed. And if verses 1 to 4 isn't enough incentive, then maybe this will help you, says Paul, that because of these things the wrath of God is coming. Rid yourselves of anger. Rid yourselves of malice. I never know what that word means, but it's wickedness. Rid yourselves of slander and filthy language. And when I was playing tennis, I, uh, on one occasion I fell over and hurt myself and those on my team were absolutely amazed that I didn't swear when I fell over. I didn't swear because I detest filthy language. I thought nothing of it, but they were simply surprised that I didn't swear. Do not lie because you are taking off your old self with its practices and you are putting on a new self being renewed in the image of the Creator. So put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Still not sure how to do this? Well, listen to Matthew Henry's remedy for dealing with sinful desires. Kill them, suppress them, as you do weeds or vermin which spread and destroy all about them or as you kill an enemy who fights against you and wounds you. I hope that's direct enough. It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Oh, the old life is over, but yeah, I know, the tail is still wagging the dog. And we exist on two planes as long as this mortal life endures. Spiritually, we belong to the age to come. Spiritually, we are seated with Christ at God's right hand, but we still struggle in this body, don't we? We still struggle as we put off the old self and welcome the new, which is being renewed into the image of Jesus. The Emperor's New Clothes. You know, as in the tale of that, was it Hans, Hans Christian Andersen? We should spend our currency on wearing new clothes. Remove the dirty rags of sin and clothe yourselves with cloth from heaven, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself, yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. 
you know, when a, uh, when a stone is thrown into, into the pond, the energy brings still water to life. The perfect symmetry of, of ripples is evidence of a change at the very centre. And while the stone is quickly unseen, the ripples testify to its presence. And so holy and dearly loved, these ripples of the Spirit testify to the presence of Christ in you. Clothe yourselves with compassion, humility, gentleness and patience. Let these qualities define who you are. Let these qualities define who we are as a church. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance with someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Uh, there's a Spanish story of a father and son who became estranged from one another. The son ran away and the father then set off to find him. He searched for months to no avail. Finally, in one last desperate effort to find him, the father put an ad in the Madrid newspaper. The ad read, Dear Paco, meet me in the front of the newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On Saturday, 800 Parkos turned up. All looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers. Corrie ten Boom and her family were arrested in the Netherlands during World War II and eventually, uh, well, she was sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp where eventually she was uh, released. Later she told of not being able to forgive a wrong that someone had committed to her, someone had done something to her and she wasn't able to offer forgiveness uh, and she kept rehashing the incident in her mind over and over and over again. Finally, Corrie cried out to the Lord for help and help came in the form of a kindly Lutheran pastor to whom Corrie wrote, I confess my failure after two sleepless nights. And the pastor replied, up in the church tower is a bell, which is rung by pulling on a rope. But you know what? After the man lets go of the rope, the bell keeps on swinging, first ding, then dong. Slower and slower until there's a final dong and it stops. And the Lutheran pastor said, I believe the same thing is true of forgiveness. When we forgive, we take our hands off the rope. But if, if we've been tugging at our grievances for a long time, we mustn't be surprised if the old angry thoughts keep coming for a while. They're just the ding-dongs of the old bell slowing down. And so it proved to be true, said Corrie. Uh, there were a few more midnight reverberations, a couple of dings when the subject came up in my conversations. Uh, but the force, which, is, which was my willingness in the matter, had gone out of them. They came less and less often, and at last those thoughts stopped altogether. See, we can trust God not only above our emotions, writes Corrie, but also above our thoughts. Let's be forgiving people, because our unity is priceless. We are a church family bought with the blood of Christ and raised with Christ who is our life. So let that define how we relate to one another. God showed us compassion so we cannot be lacking in compassion. You know, people are so reactive these days and minor conflicts escalate too easily into all-out all warfare. And I mean in our churches. So love one another and be kind to one another. Oh, battles for the gospel, yes, must be fought and won. Paul was no wimp, and when he saw errors in Corinth and Galatia, he was highly corrective, and at times he was forceful, but with a pastor's heart, with tears in his eyes, with love in his heart. And so we must love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul is asking us to put on love. Get rid of the old centered self, and put on love, as Paul says in Philippians, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, 
but each of you to the interests of others. Love one another as Christ has loved you. And you know that the Sydney Opera House recently turned 50? Uh, we Aussies love the Sydney Opera House, I think. So. Uh, it's a world-famous 20th century architectural beauty on our harbour. But, uh, but here's the thing. Uh, since sure, we might have built the Opera House, but the architect who designed it was Utzon, and he was a Danish person, and we got rid of him. And sure, the Sydney Harbour is gorgeous, but we didn't design the harbour. God gifted the harbour to us. And that means we're taking credit for something we didn't do. But that's okay, because taking credit for something we didn't do is both Aussie and Christian. See, the heart of the Christian faith is that God gives us credit for what Jesus does on our behalf, his beauty and his splendour, his victory over death, his sinless life. So let's honour him by putting to death our earthly natures and clothing ourselves with love for one another. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Well, why don't we pray? And Father, we thank you and praise you uh, that your son now sits at the Father's right hand, interceding for us. And then he calls us and he raises us to be with him. Father, we thank you for the great privilege, this, the, the wholeness of the salvation that you have given to us from death to life to heaven and glory. And so, Father, help us to put off the old self and to be the new people that you want us to be. Help us now to live as your children and not as prisoners of this world. Help us to put on these virtues that bind us together and to think about what we need to shed because we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Father, our earthly nature grieves us. So may your spirit work within us to change us and to mould us and to reform us and transform us and, and change us because our heart's desire is to be holy in your sight. Father, with all our hearts, help us to be holy. Amen.